Hey everyone. Welcome back to Linear Algebra. <clears throat> this will be lecture seven of the course. And in this section, we're going to continue uh, studying systems, and we're going to, in particular, look at equivalent systems. Uh, we'll also uh, delve into the topic of rank and the row space of a matrix. Right? It's all kind of related topics, uh, but uh, also fundamental to the study of linear algebra. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So this first, uh, we'll call this section 2.3, and we're going to start with the idea of systems that are equivalent. Right, so we've all got this idea of equivalence uh, when it comes to other mathematical objects, like we know when two numbers are equivalent, for example, when two functions are maybe equivalent. What do we mean when we say two systems are equivalent? Well, <clears throat> we'll have a definition for this. We'll say that two systems of M linear equations in N variables, okay, two systems of M linear equations in N variables are equivalent, okay, they're equivalent if and only if they have exactly the same solution set. Okay, so they're equivalent if and only if they have exactly the same solution set. Okay, okay so simple example, just so that we can make this concrete. So 2x minus y equals 1, 3x plus y equals 9. This is system 1, and consider also the system x plus 4y equals 14, and 5x minus 2y equals 4. Right now, you can take the time to solve these systems, right? But I'll just do them, I'll just show you the results quickly. So if I take this and I plug this into an augmented matrix, I have 2, negative 1, 1. 3, 1, 9. I can do my, <clears throat> my row reduction, and this matrix, uh, upon completing, putting it into reduced row echelon form, produces 1, 0, 0, 1, and the coefficients are 2 and 3. Okay, that's this guy. Okay, this other one, I can do in the same way. I can say 1, 4, 14, 5, negative 2, 4, right? I can do the same row operation. I can do row operations on this, not necessarily the same ones, but I can produce a reduced row echelon form matrix from this guy here, and I get 1, 0, 0, 1 with 2 and 3. And so the solution sets here are the same, right? They have exactly the same solution. Both, both systems have a unique solution, uh, and the solution is 2, 3. So both systems have a solution set of, in this case, just the single vector 2, 3. Okay. So the two systems are equivalent. Okay. Um, that's the idea with a with with the word equivalent with regard to systems. Two systems are equivalent if they have the same solution set. Very similar to the idea of, you know, back if you go back to like, you know, college algebra or something, we talked about equivalent uh, equations. Equations are equivalent if they have the same uh, solution <clears throat> or set of solutions. Okay, and so that is what we mean by equivalence when it comes to systems. Let's jump into another definition here, and this is going to be what this is going to kind of qu help qualify equivalence a little bit, uh, and we're going to talk about what it means for two matrices to be row equivalent. Okay, so an augmented matrix D is row equivalent. So it's row equivalent to a matrix C
to a matrix C if and only if D is obtained from C. Uh, and then by, by a finite number of row operations. Okay, so an augmented matrix D is row equivalent to a matrix C if and only if D is obtained from C by performing a finite number of row operations and specifically of type one, two, or three. Now these are just the types of row operations that we discussed pre in, in previous sections when we talked about Gaussian elimination, right? The, the usual types of row operations. This is just to further specify that we are indeed talking about the, those row operations that we're already familiar with. Okay, so by this definition, D is equivalent to C, but it turns out, and we maybe, maybe you haven't thought about this, maybe you have, C is also equivalent to D. Okay, so if, if D is equivalent to C, C must be equivalent to D. So there's a reversal on the equivalence uh, relation, right? And so in this case, it holds as well. So D equivalent to C implies that C is equivalent to D. And what does that imply? Well, it implies that row operations are reversible. Okay, so D equivalent to C if and only if C is equivalent to D. Okay, so D is equivalent to C if and only if C is equivalent to D. And the implication here is that the row operations must be reversible. All right, that means I must, if, there's a, if I have a finite number of operations, row operations that get me from D to C, then there's going to be a finite number of row operations that will take me from D back to C, right? Which means that those operations must be reversible. We haven't really talked about this. Some of them are kind of obvious, but some of them, well, I think they're mostly kind of obvious actually. Uh, but let's let's just flush them out just to make sure we can see this. Okay, let's talk about the reversibility of these row operations. So row operations are reversible. Okay. So let's uh, let's see. We'll talk about the type of the oper operation in this first column, and there'll be type one, type two and type three, those are the only three we're really interested in. Now type one was the act of taking a row and multiplying it by a non-zero constant, right? So if I have a constant times row i, then I can replace row i with that new scaled up version of row i. Right, I can do this. This is one way to notate this uh, operation. So a constant times row i becomes your new row i. Okay, now how would I reverse that operation? So effectively, I've just taken a row of the matrix and multiplied it by the letter, the number c, right? Whatever happens to be the value c, the scalar. Well, to undo that, I simply have to multiply. You can think of it as dividing the row by c, but it's better to think about it in linear algebra as multiplying the row by one over the over c by the by the reciprocal of the of the scalar All right so to reverse this i would just say row i is going to be replaced by one over c times row i All right that's the reverse operation okay so that one's kind of straightforward um, row operation two, remember that was the operation of taking C times row I plus row J and having that be the new row J. Okay, so I take a scalar, I, I, I do scalar multiplication on row one and I add it to row three and that becomes my new row three. So. So this one you may have to think about a little bit, but it turns out that it is also very simple. Uh, instead of adding the scalar to row j, I will just subtract the scalar 
right? So it'd be negative c times times i plus j, right? So just flip, you know, use the additive inverse of the whatever the scalar happens to be. Okay. <clears throat> and we'll do an example of each of these in a second just to make sure that's clear. Now row operation three is as simple as it gets. This is just the operation of flipping, interchanging two rows, the position of two rows. And so obviously to reverse that, it's simply a matter of, you know, putting them back, switching them back. Right. Okay. Let's do an example of some of these, a couple of these. Let's do a row op type one. Example. So let's say I have a matrix two, four, zero, three, one, one. Right now, if I were to if I were trying to convert this into reduce row echelon form, first thing I might do is multiply row one by one half. So let's do that. And what do I get? I get one, two, zero, and then three, one, one. Right now, if I want to reverse this, if I want to if so the row operation goes from here over to here. It goes in this direction. But if I wanted to reverse it, what would I do? I would multiply row one by the reciprocal of one half, which is in this case two. All right. So let's see what happens. Two times one is two. Two times two is four. Two times zero is zero. All right. So you can see I've reversed the operation. Right, so that's literally just exactly what we wrote up above here. Right, whatever C happens to be, if you want to reverse the effect, you multiply by the reciprocal. So that's row operation type one, reversed. How about row operation type two? Okay, row operation type two, let's say I have a matrix one, zero, three, Two one five, and let's say you know I've got a pivot here, so the next operation would be to turn this into a zero. So let's multiply by negative two. Negative two times row one plus row two becomes my new row two, right? And so that's going to be equivalent to one zero three, and then negative two times one is negative two plus two is zero, and then negative two times zero is zero plus one is one, and then Negative two times three is negative six plus five is negative one. Right, so I get this guy. Right, so again the row operation goes in this direction, but if I want to reverse it, what do I have to do? Well, according to what it says up here, whatever C happens to be, you use the additive inverse instead and do the same thing. Okay, so this is an I. Just make sure we know that's an I. Okay, so that means I'm gonna multiply row one by two instead of negative two, and I'm gonna add that to row two, and that's gonna become my new row two. Okay, so I'll have one, zero, three, and then two times one is two, plus zero is two, and then two times zero is zero, plus one is one, two times three is six, minus one is five. Okay, and you can see that I've returned row two to its original form, I've reversed it. Okay, and type three is obvious, so I won't do an example of that, but you can obviously see if I flip the position of two rows, I can obviously reverse that by flipping them back. Okay. Okay, very good. All right. So <clears throat> we're kind of building towards um, row equivalence and how that will imply a, uh, an equivalent system. Two systems are equivalent. And in order to do this, we actually need the following theorem. We need the following theorem. If a matrix D is row equivalent to a matrix C, then C is row equivalent to D. Okay. 
And so this is kind of like what we said uh, previously, right? We said, you know, I mean, this is kind of an equivalence thing, right? You typically, when you talk about equivalence relations, there is a reversibility, you know, the equivalence goes both directions. This is just making that plain, right? The proof here is completely obvious. It's an obvious consequence of the reversibility of row operations. So the proof is an obvious consequence of the reversibility of row operations. Right, so previously we said that an augmented matrix, a matrix D is row equivalent to a matrix C if and only if D is obtained from C. Well, if I can obtain D from C, then because the row operations are reversible, I can literally just flip all of those row operations and I can obtain C from D, right? So I can, I can turn it around very easily and that's all that this theorem is saying. <clears throat> okay, very good. Um, let's jump into kind of a big theorem here, kind of a big one. Okay, so let's let AX equals B be a system of linear equations. If C augmented with D is row equivalent to A augmented with B, then the system CX equals D is equivalent to AX equals B. Okay. So this kind of ties all the ideas together, right? So if AX equals B is some system, and if there's a matrix you can think of as the augmented matrix C with D, and if that augmented matrix CD is row equivalent to whatever the augmented matrix that you get out of the system AX equals B, if those two matrices are row equivalent, then whatever system is implied by, by CD, the, 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 row the augmented matrix, that system that comes out of that matrix must be equivalent to AX equals B. Okay. <clears throat> and so to really prove this very rigorously would be, I mean, it isn't like, it isn't super difficult. It just is can be somewhat time consuming. So I'm just going to sketch the proof for people. I'm going to sketch it out just because we have a lot of material to cover in the section. But here's the sketch of the proof. And I would encourage you to, you know, maybe watch how, how the proof is sketched and then go in and fill in all of the detail as good practice. Okay. So the, the, the proof of this theorem is going to be a consequence of a couple of things. The definition of equivalent systems. So the proof uses one, the definition of equivalent systems, okay, i.e. same solution sets, right? Okay, two, two systems are equivalent if they have the same solution sets. It's also going to be a consequence of the previous theorem. Right, and that basically, what was it, what did this theorem say? Well, it says uh, C equivalent to D it implies if and only, well, C is equivalent to D if and only if D is equivalent to C. That's not this previous theorem, it's the theorem before, right? Um, and then, as so I was going to use these two ideas here, and it's going and the basic approach is going to be to show that so the basic approach what, what would you need to do here well show that one augmented matrix CD is equivalent to AB implies what well implies that the solution set 
of A uh, is the same as the solution set of C. Right, so there's gonna be some solution set over here, some solution set over here. Show that they're the same. Show that they must be the same. Okay, you would start by assuming this. Assume this much. And then using these previous two ideas, you can force out that the solution sets must be the same, and there, thereby the systems have to be equal. Okay? That's the idea. That's the idea. And again, I think the proof is uh, it's it's it can be a little cum uh, little cumbersome. Little well, it's not even cumbersome. It's just lengthy. It's relatively straightforward, but it would take about fifteen or twenty minutes to go through it. So, okay, so very good. That now we have the idea of what it means for two systems to be equivalent, right? Um, and so let's move next into a very key concept in linear algebra and that's the concept of the rank of a matrix okay so we'll move into that next so before we get into the rank we do need a piece of information here we need a, this nice little theorem every matrix is row equivalent to a unique matrix in reduced row echelon form. Okay, so this is kind of a key idea. Every matrix is row equivalent to a unique, and this is important, it's a unique, a unique matrix in reduced row echelon form, RREF, reduced row echelon form. Okay. All right. So this is a this is a key uh, this is a key idea. Now I think this wouldn't be hard to for you to kind of prove to yourself, right? I think if you take a matrix and you reduce it and you convert it into reduced row echelon form, I think you would discover that just by by the way we've defined that form, it by necessity there must be a unique reduced row echelon form matrix there can't be there's it's certainly obvious that there can't be distinct ones and i think if you think it through you talk and you think through what those row operations are all about you'll see that any matrix can be put into reduced row echelon form some are cleaner than others but they all can go into the form as defined okay okay and so given that given that uh, given the fact that every matrix can be uh, put into a reduced row echelon form and that that reduced row echelon form is unique for, for each individual matrix, then we have the following definition of rank. Okay, So um, let's let A be a matrix. Okay, The rank of A is the number of non-zero rows, it's the number of non-zero rows in the unique matrix, the unique reduced row echelon form matrix of A. So the rank of A is the number of non-zero rows in the unique reduced row echelon form matrix that is equivalent to A. Okay. Well, oh, and I should say row equivalent of A. Row equivalent to A. Okay. So A, A is a matrix. We can identify the rank of A, and that's just a number, but it's the number of non-zero rows in the unique reduced row echelon form matrix that is row equivalent to A. And there's only going to be one particular RREF matrix that is row equivalent to A. Okay, and that's that's where the idea of a rank comes from. Let's let's take a look at let's take a look at an example. Okay, so let A equal two one four three two five 
0, negative 1, 1. So this is a matrix A. And we can imagine uh, performing row operations on this matrix and putting it into reduced row echelon form. And when we do that, what we get is this. Okay, we get this matrix. This matrix here uh, reduces down to this, this guy here, which is equal to, right, this is the identity matrix, uh, three by three identity matrix. Right, and so what is the rank of A? Well, the rank of A is the number of non-zero rows in this matrix. So one, two, three. The rank of this matrix is three. Okay, so we take A, we reduce it, put it into reduced row echelon form. There's going to be some of the rows are going to be non-zero, some of the rows may be zero, and if well, the rank of A is just the number of non-zero rows. You can also think of it as the number of pivots in the matrix. Okay, how about another example? Let's say I have a matrix. Let the reduced row echelon form of the matrix B equal, let's say it looks like this, 1, 0, 2, negative 1, negative 4, 0, 1, negative 6, 4, 3, and then maybe the last row is all 0. Okay, what's the rank of this matrix? So the rank of B, well, uh, you got a non zero row here, you got non zero. First of all, is this in reduced row echelon form? Indeed, right? You've got a 1 and nothing else. You got a 1, nothing else. The 1s are staircased. The bottom row is all zeros, that's fine. You've got non-zero values over here, but those are not pivot columns, so it's okay. So the reduced row echelon form of B is of you know this is a this is a matrix in reduced row echelon form. What's the rank of it? Well, it's two, isn't it? So the rank of this matrix is two. There are exactly two non-zero rows for this matrix. Right? You can also think of it as there are exactly two pivots in this reduced row echelon form matrix. Okay, all right, so um, kind of looking at these two matrices, we can, there's a couple of things, a couple of observations that can be uh, regarding homogeneous systems um, from previous sections that we can now restate in terms of rank. Right, so previously we talked about with a homogeneous system when when you would have unique solutions, or when you would have trivial and non-trivial solutions, and now we can state them as a theorem uh, uh, in in terms of rank. So let a x equals zero be a homogeneous system. in n variables and then the following right if the rank of a is less than n right it's directly less than n then the system is going to have a non-trivial solution So that's a situation like this. Maybe you have 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, something like this. Right? You have a deep, an independent variable here in the x3 position. Right? That means you're going to have a non trivial solution. In fact, you'll have infinitely many solutions. Right? And then this is a case where the number of Variables are three, but my rank is only two in this example. Okay, so you'll have, in this case, you'd have a non-trivial solution. What about part two? What if the rank of A is equal to N? Well, then you have only the trivial solution. So the system will have only the trivial solution. 
right? And that's a that's a situation like this one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero, right? And so you can kind of think of this as x one equals zero, x two equals zero, x three equals zero. There's no other possible solution, right? Okay, and so we talked about these in the previous lecture when we talked about homogeneous systems, right? And now there's this connection between the rank of the matrix and the solution set for a homogeneous system. Okay, and I think this is an easy proof for people to work through. Again, I think I'll leave it to you to uh, spin that up, but uh, I mean, what's it gonna look like? How's it gonna go? Well, you're just gonna, what are you gonna do? You're gonna start with this matrix, right? All right, you're going to put it into RREF. Okay, and then you're going to make an assumption about the rank, and then you're going to reason about it. Sorry about that. So you're going to start with this, this matrix here. You're going to put it into RREF. Assume, at this point, the, the proof will branch into two pieces. You'll say, assume the rank of A is less than N on one branch, and the other branch will say, let's assume the rank of A is equal to N. What does that imply about the reduced rush echelon form of this homogeneous system? And, uh, you know, it should all kind of spin out of that pretty quickly. Okay, so it's just pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward proof. A lot of, a lot of conversational language probably would be in, involved in that proof. All right, great. Okay, um, another theorem. Okay. Let's let uh, let AX equals zero be a homogeneous system. Be a homogeneous system of M linear equations. Okay, in n variables. Okay, so AX equals zero be a homogeneous system of m linear equations in n variables. Okay, then if m is less than n, the system will automatically have a non-trivial solution. Is that obvious? Well, if if the system has only m equations, but it has n variables, and m is less than n, then the rank of m is necess sorry the rank of a is ne by necessity less than n. Right? This is going to the clear implication is that the system will have a non-trivial solution. Right, if m is less than n, then that implies basically that the rank of a is less than n, which implies non-trivial solution. Right, the, the rank of the matrix can't exceed the number of rows of the matrix. If the matrix only has m rows uh, and m is less than n, then the rank has to be less than the number of variables which means you'll have a non-trivial solution. So this is a quick consequence of the previous theorem. <clears throat> All right. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, and so that's kind of our introduction to rank. Right? And rank will come up all the time. Rank will be something we discuss, maybe not every lecture, but probably every other. Okay, let's uh, recap what we were talk what we talked about a, a while ago with regard to linear combinations. We want to move next into this into the idea of row space and what row space is all about. So we need to recap uh, and revisit our pre some of our previous discussion on uh, linear combinations. So consider this example, right? So say I've got a a, a vector negative 18, 15, and 16. Well, this is a linear combination of three other vectors, right? And those, and the three, well, that's a linear combination of an infinite variety of vectors, but 
these three in particular. If I take two times negative four, one, two, plus four times two, one, zero, minus three times six, negative three, negative four. Right, so I've got vector one, vector two, vector three, scalar, scalar, scalar. So if I were to do this mathematics here and just kind of add all this together, I would get this, this uh, vector over here. Uh, what that means is that the vector negative 18, 15, 16 is a linear combination of these three vectors or sorry, these three scalars, uh, and we'll call it a1 equals 2, a2 equals 4. Oh, sorry. The vector is a linear combination of the other vectors. Negative 4, 1, 2, 2, 1, 0, and 6, negative 3, negative 4. It's a linear combination of those three vectors. And in particular, the scalars 2, 4, and negative 3 are, are the scalars that are required to create the linear combination. Okay? And so one, one way to sort of analogize this would be to think of this vector here as the destination uh, kind of the destination point in 3D space, right? And these, and think of these three vectors as the uh, sort of the, what would be the word, the primary directions, right? So, so we'll call this vector one, vector two, and then a3, a1, a2, a3, and we'll call this x. Okay, so kind of just to put this into words here. So x is the destination in 3D space, in this case 3D space, because these are vectors in R3. So X is the destination in 3D space, and A1, A2, and A3 are the primary directions Right, they're the primary directions. Right, and so what does this linear combination say? Well, it says go two times in this direction plus four times in this direction minus three times in this direction. And when you do that, you'll get to the destination. Right, so it's like this vector here, this is gonna sound kind of dork, kind of cheesy, but like this vector has an address, <laughs> so to speak, in, in R3, in, in the space, in R3 according to these vectors. So negative 18, 15, 16 has an address uh, that can be gotten to using A1, A2, and A3. Okay, so that again, that's just like, this is a little bit like a metaphor here, right? You want to get to this address. These are the only directions you can move in, the direction of these vectors. This linear combination tells you how to move in each of the directions in order to get to this destination. Okay, so some vectors uh, can be gotten to using only these directions, and some vectors cannot. So there are some vectors in in R3 that you can't get to using these three fundamental directions, these three primary directions. Let's see an example of that. Okay, so some vectors, <laughs> some vectors in R3 cannot be gotten to using uh, a1 equals negative 4, 1, 2, a2 equals 2, 1, 0, and a3 equals 6, negative 3, negative 4. So some vectors in R3 cannot be arrived at using these three, right? Let's see an example, such as, such as the vector 16, 
negative 3, and 8. This is a vector that you cannot get to using these three primary directions. Okay, let's see why that's true. How, can, how do we know that's true? Well, what we could do is, is kind of think through what would have to be true in order for this vector 16, negative 3, 8 to be a linear combination of the, of the other three vectors. So to get to, uh, what was it, 16, negative 3, 8, using a1 equals negative 4, 1, 2, a2 equals 2, 1, 0, and a3 equals 6, negative 3, negative 4. What would have to be true? Well, there's going to have to exist scalars that'll get us there, right? So to get from, you know, using, using these three fundamental directions to get to this point, we need the following. All right, we basically need 16, negative 3, 8, that vector, to be equal to some scalar times a1, a2, times a3, right? So c1, negative 4, 1, 2, plus c2, 2, 1, 0, plus c3, 6, negative 3, negative 4, right? Then we need, we need those scalars. So we need some c1, c2, c3 real numbers. Right now, how would we go about finding them? Well, we can think of this as a system, right? To find C1, C2, C3, think of the combination as a system. Think of the linear combination as a system. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, negative 4 times C1 plus 2 times C2 plus 6 times C3 equal, needs to equal 16, right? The first components have to equal 16 when you add them all up. Second components, likewise. So you're going to need C1 plus C2 minus 3. C3 needs to equal negative 3. And then, you know, likewise for the third components. So 2C1 plus 0C2 minus 4C3, that needs to equal 8, right? So here's a system, right? So this linear combination can be thought of as a system, right? And if that's the case, we can plug it into a matrix, right? And when we do that, we get what? We get negative 4, 2, 6, 16, 1, 1, negative 3, negative 3, 2, 0, negative 4, 8. Right? So you can represent it like that, and we can do the work. But I've already done the work, and so I'm going to tell you the answer. When you put this into reduced row echelon form, you get 1, 0, negative 2, negative, negative 11 thirds, and then you get 0, 1, negative 1, 2 thirds, and then you get 0, 0, 0, 46 over 3. Okay. And so this is the reduced row echelon form of this matrix. And so what you can see here is that you have, you know, a contradiction here in the third row of the matrix. The system is inconsistent. So the third row of the matrix is going to indicate that the solution does not exist and that the system is inconsistent. All right, so what does that mean in the context of our metaphor? Well, it means that there are no directions uh, available to the final vector 16, negative 3, 8 along the given direction vectors that we have. So there is no way to get to 16, negative 3, 8 using the direction vectors uh, 4, 
3, negative 4. Okay? Right, so in the context of our metaphor, we can't use these fundamental directions and arrive at this destination. Okay? All right. So that's just another way of saying that 16, negative 3, 8 cannot be written as a linear combination of these three vectors. Okay? All right, so that's just an example to kind of refresh our minds on what we mean by linear combinations, but also to kind of build, start building up this metaphor of a linear combination sort of being a set of directions, right? So we saw in the previous example, sometimes a vector can be written as a linear combination. We also saw that sometimes a vector cannot be written as a linear combination. Uh, and then finally, thirdly, it is sometimes possible that a particular vector, a given vector, will have more than one distinct linear combinations. Right? So here's another example. If I take the vector 14, negative 21, 7, and I set that equal to C1, 2, negative 3, 1, plus C2, negative 4, 6, negative 2, well, it turns out that there are a multitude of possibilities for C1 and C2 that would get me to this destination, right? And we can see that by, again, plugging this in as a, think of this as a system, dropping it into an augmented matrix, and reducing the matrix, right? So we can think of this as 2C1 minus 4C2 equals 14 and negative 3c1 plus 6c2 equals negative 21 and c1 minus 2c2 equals 7 so this is your system right and that implies this matrix 2 negative 4 14 negative 3 6 negative 21 1 negative 2 7 all right, so again, just taking those coefficients, putting them here, taking the scalars, putting them there. Right, and this has two columns because there are two variables. It's your C1 column, your C2 column. All right, we can run through the, we can subject this to Gauss-Jordan row reduction. We can put it into RREF. And when we do that, what we get is 1, negative 2, 7, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It looks like this. So you can see that C2 is independent, right? So it's totally independent. Uh, so C2 is an independent variable. Right, it's got no pivot, right? You just have a pivot here. There's no pivot in the second column. C2 is an independent variable. So it's, its value can vary naturally. And whatever you choose, C, whatever you select for C2, you can force out some value of C1. C1 will be forced out by whatever selection of C2. Okay, so let's see a couple of examples. So letting C2 equal 1, for example. Well, if C2 is equal to 1, then C1 is going to be equal to, so you're going to kind of flip this onto the other side, so it'll be 7 plus 2 times C1, or sorry, 2 times C2. So it'll be 7 plus 2 times 1, which is 9. Okay, And so that means C, C1 is 9, C2 is 1. Does that produce a valid linear combination? Well, let's see here. 14, negative 21, 7 is equal to 9 times 2, negative 3, 1, plus 1 times negative 4, 6, negative 2. All right, so I think you could... You could, you could check this out. 9 times 2 is 18, plus negative 4 is 14. 
9 times negative 3 is negative 27, plus 6 is negative 21. Right, and the last one holds as well. So that's one such linear combination. Another example would be found by letting C2 equal 0. If C2 is 0, then C1 is equal to 7 plus 2 times 0, which is just 7. Okay, so let's see. So that says that 14, negative 21, and 7 must be equal to 7 times 2, negative 3, 1, plus 0, times negative 4, 6, 2. Does that work? Yeah, 14 is definitely equal to 7 times 2. Everything over here is always 0. Negative 21 is definitely equal to 7 times negative 3, and 7 is equal to 7 times 1. So again, there's another example. How many are there? Okay, there are, this, this particular vector here will uh, can be written at, there'll be an infinite number of linear combinations to get you to this vector. Okay, so there are infinitely many. Okay, all right, very good. Okay, so that's just a kind of a review of linear combinations. And this in this last example, what the, in the context of the metaphor we're trying to develop, we can say to ourselves, well, if I want to get to this destination along these two primary directions, then there are infinitely many ways to do it. Okay, there's infinitely many ways to do it. I can do it first by going nine times this and then one times that. I can do it next by going seven times this plus zero times that. I could, there's, some, there's some combination that involves C2 equal to 2, C2 equal to 3, 4, all the way up to bajillions, and in every direction, right? So there's an infinite number of linear combinations. There's an infinite number of ways to get to this destination using these two directions. Okay. All right. So with that in mind, let's jump into the idea of the row space. Okay. So let's let A be an M by N matrix okay then the subset of rn right so these are n n tuples right these are vectors and with n n elements so the subset of rn consisting of all vectors that are linear combinations of the rows of A is called the row space of A. Space. Ah. It's called the row space of A. Okay. So if A is an M by N matrix, that means it has M equations. It's a, if thinking of it as a system, it's gonna have, well, we'll think of it as a matrix. A is an M by N matrix. It has M rows and N columns, okay? The subset of Rn, right? These are N dimensional vectors. The subset of Rn that consists of all the vectors that are linear combinations of the rows of A, that's what we mean by the row space of A. Okay. Right? That's what we mean by the row space of A. Another way to think about it, another way to think about it is that the row space of a matrix, uh, you can think of it as the set of all possible destinations that can be gotten to using the matrix rows as the fundamental directions. Right? It's the set of all possible destinations that can be gotten to using the matrix rows as the fundamental directions. Okay, so let's, let's write that down. Okay, so the row space is the set of all possible destinations in Rn, right, n-dimensional vectors that can be arrived at, that can be gotten to 
using the matrix rows as the directions that can be gotten to using the matrix rows as the fundamental directions. Okay. Right, so this just extends that metaphor. So so before the, the first example we had one unique destination. We had a destination that we could get to using only one particular linear combination. That was our first example. The second example we had a destination that we couldn't get to using the, the given vectors, right? There was no such linear combination. And then the third example, we had a destination that you could get to using infinitely many uh, distinct linear combinations, right? So the first example and the third example were both vectors in the row space. The second example, when you can't get to it using the given vectors, there's no linear combination, then that vector is not in the row space. Okay. So let's kind of visualize it like this, right? If I have a matrix A and I want to think of the first row as a vector, the second row is a vector, right? And then the mth row as a vector. Okay, so there's m rows, and let's just assume there's n columns. Okay. Then the row space of A is the set, right? What is it? It's the set of vectors um, that have this form, right? So it would be C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2 plus dot 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 plus CM times VM such that C1, C2, dot dot dot, CM are all real numbers. Right, so take every possible combination of those vec those, those scalars, C1 through Cm, plug them into this linear combination. The vector you get out is in the row space. Do that exhaustively, and you have the entirety of the row space. Okay? Excellent. All right. Very good. Um, very good. I think, I think we will pause here and uh, pick up the rest of the of the lecture in a part b okay so we'll pause here and pick up the rest of the lecture in part b